Good morning, my name is Audra and I will be your conference facilitator today. Welcome to Chevron's third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session and instructions will be given at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the conference call, please press star and then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I will now turn the conference call over to the General Manager of Investor Relations of Chevron Corporation, Mr. Wayne Bordoon. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Audra. Welcome to Chevron's third quarter earnings conference call and webcast. I'm Wayne Bordoon, General Manager of Investor Relations, and on the call with me today are Mark Nelson, EVP of Downstream and Chemicals, and Pierre Breber, CFO. We'll refer to the slides that are available on Chevron's website. Before we get started, Please be reminded that this presentation contains estimates, projections, and other forward-looking statements. Please review the cautionary statement on slide two. Now I'll turn it over to Pierre. Thanks, Wayne. Third quarter earnings were about break-even. Improved from last quarter, but reflecting continued challenging market conditions. A reconciliation of non-GAAP measures can be found in the appendix to this presentation. Special items totaled $220 million, including a tax charge related to a settlement agreement on asset retirement funding and other items tied to the expiration next August of the Rokan production sharing contract in Indonesia. Free cash flow was almost $2 billion, and the dividend was flat with last quarter. Turning to slide four. Cash flow from operations improved as commodity prices increased from their lows in the second quarter. Included this quarter was a $265 million cash payment to the ROCAN settlement agreement. Our cash flow dividend breakeven was under $50 Brent due to improved downstream performance and our strong capital and operating cost management. We ended the quarter with a net debt ratio over 17%, well below our competitors. Even after closing the Noble acquisition and stepping up its debt to fair value, we expect to maintain the leading balance sheet among the peer group. We're committed to protecting our financial strength during this ongoing crisis. Turning to the next slide, our 2020 capital spending is trending below our latest guidance. Looking ahead, we expect next year's capital budget to be $14 billion, below the combined 2020 guidance from Chevron and Noble, and well below Chevron's five-year guidance from our March investor day. Our 2021 capital budget will continue to prioritize investments that drive long-term value and shows the capital flexibility in our portfolio, including assets recently added from Noble. We'll share additional details in December after formal approval. Operating, expendi operating expenditures in the quarter were more than 10% lower than our 2019 quarterly average ahead of our guidance. Turning to slide six. Relative to the same period last year, third quarter adjusted upstream earnings decreased due to lower realizations and reduced liftings, primarily due to curtailments, partially offset by lower depreciation and operating expenses. Adjusted downstream earnings decreased primarily due to lower sales volumes and margins. The other segment was higher, primarily due to various corporate charges. Turning to slide seven. Compared to the second quarter, third quarter earnings increased by about $8 billion, more than half due to the absence of second quarter special items. Adjusted upstream earnings were up almost $2 billion, primarily due to higher liquids realization. Adjusted downstream earnings increased by over $1 billion, primarily due to higher sales volumes and margins and favorable swings in both timing effects and lower cost or market inventory adjustments at CP Chem. The other segment charges decreased primarily due to a favorable swing in accruals for stock-based compensation. Turning to, turning to production. Third quarter, oil equivalent, oil equivalent production, excluding acid sales, was 3% lower than a year ago. During the past 12 months, we closed a number of acid sales, all signed pre-pandemic. Increased Permian production and higher entitlement effects were offset primarily by curtailments and higher turnarounds. The curtailments were in line with our guidance range 
and reflect mostly OPEC plus reductions in Kazakhstan and Africa and market driven constraints in Thailand. Now I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Pierre. As shown on slide nine, the operating environment has improved from the lows in the second quarter, but is still challenged. Some products like diesel and petrochemicals have been more resilient during the pandemic, and we've been able to develop new customer channels. Conversely, jet demand has only modestly recovered. The tough demand picture has resulted in weak product margins well below cyclical averages. Since the crisis started, we've been focused on what we can control, safe and reliable operations, cost management, and value chain optimization. In the third quarter, our financial results improved due to strong performance in these areas, along with some margin improvement in polyethylene and West Coast fuels. Turning to the next slide, our focus on cost management is delivering results, with third quarter operating expenses nearly 20% lower than pre-pandemic levels in the first quarter. I'm proud of how our employees have risen to this challenge, streamlining work processes, reducing contractor costs, and adapting activity levels to a lower margin environment. Our teams have also delivered on more than 90% of the planned scope of our 2020 turnaround program, deferring only a minor amount of activity. This is a tremendous accomplishment and positions our refinery network to be ready without a backlog when the economy is back to pre-pandemic levels. Optimization activities further reduce the cost of this year's planned work contributing to lower operating expenses. Turning to the next slide, as always, we're focused on safe and reliable operations, keeping our employees safe, being a good neighbor, and delivering the products that the world needs are all part of our license to operate. Since the economic slowdown began, we've balanced efficient refinery utilization with the highest margin sales channels for our products. We've consistently placed more than 90% of our high value products into our contracted sales channels, despite volatility and demand. This generates the best margins across our value chains. The recent acquisitions of marketing assets in Australia and the Pasadena refinery on the U.S. Gulf Coast further extend our value chains in those regions, giving us more opportunities to improve profitability and returns. Turning to chemicals, GS Caltex continues to make good progress on their new mixed feed cracker. We expect the project to be under budget and months ahead of schedule. Our local team has done a remarkable job safely progressing the project despite the challenges of COVID-19. At CP Chem, we've completed feed at our U.S. Gulf Coast Cracker 2 project and have placed it on hold as we assess market conditions. We continue to believe in the long-term fundamentals of chemicals and the importance of world-scale facilities with access to low-cost feedstock. At the same time, any new investment needs to be supported by project economics that will generate strong returns through the price cycle. Also, CPCAM began producing circular polyethylene at scale, an industry first in the United States. The production of PE from plastic waste is an important milestone and underscores our commitment to finding innovative ways to deliver sustainable products to our customers. Now, turning to renewable fuels. The future of energy is lower carbon, and we're delivering more alternative products to our customers. Recently, we announced first gas at our Cal Bio Renewable Natural Gas Joint Venture in California and a new partnership with Brightmark. Our capital committed to RNG ventures is over $200 million. In renewable diesel, we're leveraging existing infrastructure to co-process biofeed at our El Segundo refinery with startup expected in the first half of next year. Also, we sell a range of branded biodiesels and are piloting the sale of R99 in Southern California. Through Novi, we recently announced first production of renewable base oil at our 500 barrel a day plant in Texas. This leading technology partnership has developed an innovative and sustainable product with future expansion potential. And lastly, our GS Caltex hydrogen testing site in South Korea has opened, the first of its kind in Seoul where customers can purchase traditional fuels as well as hydrogen and electricity. All of these efforts align with how we're increasing renewables in support of our business, part of our approach to the energy transition, which Pierre will now further discuss. Thanks, Mark. We continue to make good progress in our energy transition focus areas. 
Next year, we expect to fund $100 million of projects identified with our marginal abatement cost curves. The MAC tool helps us select the most cost-efficient projects to reduce carbon intensity across our operations. As Mark noted, we announced a new joint venture with Brightmark, extending our renewable natural gas portfolio. Finally, in our partnership with Savante, we're pleased to have been awarded a U.S. DOE grant to help fund the construction of a demonstration carbon capture plant in our California upstream operations. The project is expected to start up in 2022. These projects reflect Chevron's commitment to low carbon solutions that are both good for the environment and good for our shareholders. Turning to the next slide. We closed the Noble Energy acquisition earlier this month and integration is on track. We've completed employee selections, had some early quick wins like paying off the revolver and selling its plane, and assessment of operational opportunities is well on its way. In the third quarter, Noble generated positive free cash flow, primarily due to ongoing capital and cost management and strong sales in the Eastern Med. We're pleased to add Noble assets and welcome its talented employees to Chevron. Our internal transformation, launched late last year, is mostly, comp mostly complete, with a new organization in place November 1st. This was an enterprise-wide change effort, the largest since our Texaco merger, that modernizes how we work, leveraging digital tools and empowered teams. Lastly, we recently signed an agreement to sell our Appalachia natural gas business. We expect to close the transaction before the end of the year. Now, looking forward, in the fourth quarter, we expect noble, product, noble production to be lower, primarily due to seasonal demands in the Eastern Med. Curtailments and planned downtime are both lower than last quarter. Production this quarter may include additional cost recovery barrels related to the Rokan settlement. At Gorgon, Train 2 weld repairs are now complete, and we have started commissioning in, pre in preparation for LNG production. We expect Train 1 to be taken out of service after Train 2 is back online. At TCO, remobilization continues. We successfully increased the project workforce to near 15,000, and our plans are to end the year with a project team over 20,000. Earlier this week, we completed our final sea lift on schedule. All modules are now in Kazakhstan, a significant project milestone. And finally, we expect severance payments to lower cash flow. With that, I'll turn it over to Wayne. Thanks, Pierre. That concludes our prepared remarks. We're now ready to take your questions. Keep in mind that we do have a full queue, so please try to limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. We'll do our best to get to all of your questions answered. Audra, please open the line. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press star one on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press star two. If you are listening on a speakerphone, we ask you to please lift your handset before asking your question to provide optimum sound quality. Again, if you have a question, please press star one on your touchtone telephone. We'll go first to Neil Mehta at Goldman Sachs. Good morning. Uh, I have one uh, upstream question here and one downstream question. So maybe Mark, I'll start on the downstream question, which is, it looked like uh, the, the downstream re results, and particularly refining uh, surprise relative to our expectations. Was there anything that you would call out here in the third quarter, as many of the independent refiners had very tough third quarters, including on the West Coast. Uh, and just can you then step back and talk about your big picture outlook for the refining sector and that part of your business? Uh, thanks for the question, Neil. First, if I, if I step back and look operationally at the third quarter performance overall, I, I would say that operationally it was, it was first driven by our continued cost management efforts across the downstream chemicals portfolio, much of which is actually focused in our manufacturing uh, sector. Um, also some, some polyethylene and West Coast fuels margin improvement, and then contribution from our lubricants and additives business. 
if I step back and look at the refining sector in general, I, you know, I would say that the, the pre the pandemic demand shock clearly has retested margin margin lows. There's not a real analog for the for the pace of of recovery. But the three things are required, I think, to have sustainable improved refining margins. Um, first, demand recovery for all high value products. You know, in our materials, we've certainly indicated that as an industry, we're within you know five to ten percent of 2019 motor gasoline and diesel levels. Um, but but jet is is still only half half of 2019, and so we need continued recovery there. Uh, second, we need inventory reduction, and we're we're beginning to see some of that in different parts of the world. And finally, refinery rationalization. And this is the part that's, that's interesting for us because we've rationalized, rationalized our portfolio over the past decade, and we're now seeing competitors start to do that. In some of the regions of the world, like Southeast Asia, Australia, and the U.S. coast, you're, you're hearing people talk about uh, rationalization, which certainly creates an opportunity for us going forward as the supply and demand balance uh, tightens a bit over time. Thanks for the question, Neil. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and then... Here, follow-ups for you. It's on Gorgon. Um, where do we stand with Train 2, and what do we know about Train 1 and 3 in terms of um, managing uh, managing the downtime there? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Well, as I said, the weld repairs are complete. Uh, we verified them with uh, non-destructive testing. We've also completed pressure testing of, uh, of the kettle. So we're now in the process of getting back online. So we've started the recommissioning process um, from the turnaround and the, the extended turnaround. The next steps are to dry out the systems, and then we'll begin cool down. We expect this to take several weeks, which will put first LNG production in the second half of November. In terms of train one, as I said, we expect that to be taken down soon after train two is back online. Um, and then we would inspect train one, and depending on whether repairs are required or not, that, that'll determine how long train one is down, and then sequentially, then we would look to train three uh, after that one. Okay, Thanks, guys. We'll move next to Janine Wei at Barclays. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. My first question morning, is on Jean. sustaining, good morning. My first question is on sustaining CapEx, and the second one is on uh, the upstream with Eastern Med. So the second half 2020 CapEx run rate, that's below your multi-year sustaining upstream capital estimate of $10 billion. Um, you've accomplished a lot this year with cost reductions and efficiency improvements. So my first question is whether there's an update to that $10 billion in sustaining capital number that you provided a few quarters ago, and I know we've got Noble in the mix now too. Thanks, Janine. Uh, no, there isn't. I mean, the $10 billion is really an estimate, right? It's based on our, uh, again, Chevron only, how to sustain production in the short term. Noble gave out an equivalent number around $800 million uh, for that. You know, to be clear, we're not trying to sustain short-term production. Mark just talked about we're in uh, an, an, an economy that's impacted by a pandemic, and demand for our products is below uh, normal levels and pre-pandemic levels, and therefore we have oversupplied markets. We are trying to sustain the long-term value of the enterprise. So if you look to our 2021 uh, capital guidance of $14 billion, it includes an upstream uh, capital uh, more than, you know, around $11 billion or so, so higher than the sustaining level, but not all of it is going to short-term production. Some of it is going to long-term production, like our project at Tangiz. So we're focused on sustaining long-term value, not uh, short-term production. Um, that's true in combination with Noble, uh, but, but, as, but, as you see, but there's no real update to, to those numbers. The efficiency improvements are rolling through, but this is a, an estimate, an analytical estimate that's not so precise that we're going to be updating it frequently. Okay, great. Thank you. Understood. Um, my second question is on the Eastern Med. Could you provide any initial indications or thoughts on how you expect to monetize Leviathan and a lot of the other discovered resource in the area? Um, I guess specifically, do you think that regional demand growth could be strong enough in the medium term or longer term to avoid either Greenfield LNG or a pipeline to Europe? And then um, if I could squeeze one more in there, if there's any commentary on the headlines on the pricing dynamics, that would be helpful. Thank you. 
All right, thanks, Janine. Well, I won't comment on the on some of the headlines you've read. Those are commercial matters uh, that that we'll we'll discuss in private with our partners and with our customers. We've had a very smooth transition uh, with our operations in Eastern Med and all across with Noble Assets. Uh, our integration is on track. Uh, the employee selections in the United States have already happened. Uh, we, we feel really good. We're pleased with uh, uh, the people who are joining us in the Eastern Med included. So, um, you know, Noble employees are uh, are, are top quality, and we're, we're very pleased to be welcome, welcoming them to um, Chevron. As you know, it's a good resource. It's free cash flow positive. The project's been completed. Uh, it's in an area where um, there's demand opportunities, in particular backing out coal, uh, but it's only been a few weeks. So, you know, our focus right now is to have a smooth integration with Noble. Uh, we're pleased, again, with the operations and the free cash flow generation. Uh, we're going to work with uh, potential customers, existing customers, future customers, to find the most cost-efficient way to develop that resource. There is upside uh, to it, and again, there's market, but that'll, uh, you know, we'll determine that all in time. Thanks, Janine. We'll move next to Phil Gresh at J.P. Morgan. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, first question here, if, if I look at the third quarter, it looks like uh, your Brent-based uh, break-even price, somewhere in the order of, of $50 a barrel, um, and you've, you're talking about, um, you know, this restructuring plan that's been underway and uh, kind of completing here. So I was just curious how you think about the cost side of the equation and, and the ability to um, further lower the operating costs and the break even moving forward, given, uh, you know, given that you've given us the capital number here already. Yeah, you know, we the the break even, and again, we would have it a little bit below $50. Uh, it's important that it, it doesn't factor in downstream margins or chemical margins and other parts of our business, which, uh, you know, Mark has addressed, and, and those can vary, and they can make a difference, obviously, on, on where the break-even is. I mean, margins in that sector are pretty low, and as they recover, um, that, that lowers our break-even because, again, it's, it's holding, it's just looking at the oil price and not all the other assumptions. In terms of cost, Look, we, our, our costs were down more than 10% uh, this quarter. We provide a guidance that we expect to end the year on a Chevron-only basis here because uh, fourth quarter will have noble operating expenses. But if you just looked at Chevron-only, we would be down a billion dollars. Again, we've characterized that as activity-related and other actions that we've taken uh, to manage through um, the pandemic and the crisis that we're in. Uh, we've also provided guidance, and we've completed our transformation. So we launched that transformation, which is a – enterprise-wide restructuring. Uh, we started that uh, almost 12 months ago, and we just are completing our employee selections uh, right now. Uh, it's a tough time for our employees as they're being notified, um, and we'll have the new organization in place November 1. We've talked about a billion dollars of um, OPEX reductions um, from the transformation. And then finally, we have the noble synergies, and, and, and we've talked about 300 million of total noble synergies. Not all of that is operating expense. So all of that is rolling through. We'll bring that together um, for you, you know, likely at our investor day on any kind of update, updated guidance. But it's all consistent with your question, which is we're working hard uh, to get our break even down. Uh, you know, we've sustained our dividend, uh, so the comparisons are consistent, um, and and uh, and we, you know, we continue to make progress both through capital discipline and cost management uh, to lower our break even. Uh, preserve our balance sheet strength, right, ending the quarter uh, with uh, the leading uh, balance sheet in the industry, a net debt ratio of 17%. That's, that's essentially what we're doing, and we'll continue to do it as we're in the challenging times. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my second question um, would just be as it relates to 2021 production. Obviously, you gave us a CapEx number here. On the last call, you talked about the, the Permian potentially declining a uh, high single-digit rate. Uh, year over year in 21 on an organic basis. Obviously, you're layering in Noble here. So, I didn't know if maybe you could provide any early read on, on 21 production, whether it's standalone or pro forma, or, or if not a hard number, maybe some moving pieces around it. Yeah, we'll provide our production guidance um, as we normally do. That'll be on our fourth quarter call at the end of January. We did provide guidance for the fourth quarter, so we, we, we do a quarter ahead. Um, I think you've hit some of the pieces uh, there. Uh, again, you know, I would add the uh, Brocan uh, PSC expiration, which I referred to, uh, and we had a settlement agreement, which is a really good agreement that 
uh, assures the certainty around the funding for abandonment and uh, adds a little drilling activity to keep uh, production managed heading into that contract expiration. But that's going to be in August of 2021, so I'd point that out. Um, and again, you know, our efforts, the Permian, what Jay talked about, is a potential decline of 6 to 7% if we stay at those activity levels. So uh, I don't really have more to say, Phil, to you. We'll provide that guidance when we finalize our plans, uh, get formal approval of our capital budget, and we'll do it at our regular time uh, during the fourth quarter earnings call. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Next, we'll move to Devin McDermott at Morgan Stanley. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. So, Hi, Devin. For, hey. So the, the first one I wanted to ask on is actually around some of the uh, latest investments and, and momentum that you've made on uh, emissions reductions. And you know, there's been some positive announcements here over the last few months. And I think the disclosure on this marginal abatement cost curve is interesting in that it shows there's opportunities to potentially reduce emissions while also you know, boosting returns of the, the negative implied cost of carbon that you have there. The question specifically, as we think about kind of over the next few years here, any sense of the depth of opportunities where you can actually have this nice win-win of, of driving down costs while also reducing carbon intensity? And then as you think about planning longer term, uh, any intentions of expanding your, your emission production goals that, that already exist, perhaps uh, to be you know, uh, as we move post-2023 in line with Paris climate, like some of your peers have done, and just how you're thinking about that longer term? Sure. Uh, on the second question, as you said, we have four carbon intensity reduction uh, metrics. They go out to 2023. Um, 2023 was chosen because that's the first first uh, stock take date under the Paris agreements, uh, and so we're aligned with those. We're the only company, first company, only company in our sector to do it on an equity basis. Uh, many do it on on an operatorship basis, and then we do oil and gas metrics separately because they serve a different market. So the $100 million that um, you're referring to is uh, something that we expect will be recurring. So we see opportunities for a number of years to be able to invest uh, th that kind of expenditure and achieve what we would call cost-efficient carbon reductions. Uh, but if I uh, – and, and yes, will we extend uh, at some point in time? I think, yes, the, the answer is yes. Um, it would be logical for us to go to the next Paris stock take uh, date, but we're right now focused on on delivering on those 2023 targets. We also have those uh, as part of the incentive pay of almost uh, all, all, every Chevron employee. So we're making good progress on that. But I would think all of our energy transition activities, and Mark referred to a number in, in his business, um, they really support uh, making our business more sustainable in a lower carbon future, and they do it in a way where we earn returns. So the renewable natural gas, uh, that uh, Mark was talking about also generates returns. And then, of course, then we're looking at some of the new technologies, and those uh, obviously are at a different stage of maturity. So we're taking a number of actions that uh, we believe address climate change, uh, that lowers uh, carbon, and does it in a way that's good for the environment and good for our shareholders. Great. That makes a lot of sense. And then my, my second question is just on the portfolio composition post the, the noble transaction. So you recently executed on the Appalachia sale. You've done a good job in terms of uh, kind of pruning the, the portfolio and, and investing non-core assets over time as we kind of look forward here post this transaction. Any updated thoughts on, on further uh, opportunities for divestitures and whether or not or I guess a part of the question you could address things like noble midstream or anything within the noble portfolio that might be non-core uh, and lastly, uh, whether or not as part of the noble transaction guaranteeing uh, noble's outstanding debt is part of uh, what you're visioning. Okay, Devin, I got the asset sales. What, what was the question about noble debt at the end? Whether, we'll uh, whether or not that will be okay. guaranteed okay. by Chevron. All right, thanks. Uh, well, let me just address noble, noble debt. Um, you know, we're reviewing options. We haven't made a decision. And, and again, we'll notify bondholders when we make that decision, and you should expect that in the next couple of months. Uh, in terms of asset sales, we're on track to complete uh, the program that we talked about. You know, it was 2018 to 2020, a three-year program of five to ten billion dollars in before-tax proceeds. We expect to close um, the, our U.S. natural gas sale here uh, before year end, and when we complete that, we'll be right in the middle. Uh, of that range. In terms of what else is in the public domain, the most significant 
um, ownership interest that we've talked about is selling our interest in in, in uh, Northwest Shelf, and that's a commercial matter, and we just won't we won't comment on. Um, but I guess I would just say we're in a different place than many of our competitors, right? Uh, Mark referred to uh, the rationalization we've done on our refining network uh, over the last decade, and, and even and even before. Uh, I, I referred to the number of acid sales that we've completed in the last 12 months. You saw that in our production chart, all that were signed pre-pandemic at, at good values. Obviously, we just bought uh, a bunch of assets, or a company that comes with high quality assets, and I won't comment on any, any specific assets in the Noble portfolio. So we're very value uh, driven. Uh, the gas assets that we have um, uh, that we're planning to close here uh, before the year, year end and our interest in Northwest Shelf um, you know, have held up better in this post-pandemic world. Also, if you think of Northwest Shelf, it's more almost like an infrastructure investment as the resource behind the plant um, comes down and it becomes more of a tolling facility going forward. So you'll continue to see us to be disciplined in how we manage our portfolio. Uh, I would not expect us to have any kind of uh, big program uh, announcement. You know, we'll have the, uh, con you know, the ongoing uh, portfolio rationalization that's been part of the Chevron um, approach to management for, for a long time. Great. Thank you very much. We'll go next to Paul Chang at Scotia Bank. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, two Paul. questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions. I think one is for Mark and uh, one is for uh, Pierre. Uh, okay. Pierre, uh, what would be a reasonable allocation of future capital in the new renewable or low carbon initiative? Uh, and to let's assume that at some point you probably will set up a target to be net carbon zero on at least group one or two, uh, maybe over the next 15, 20 years. Uh, do you need uh, other new business, like some of your peers go into uh, the renewable power business uh, in order to achieve that? So that's the first question. The second question is for Mark. If I look at over the last uh, uh, couple quarters, one of the big performance difference between you guys in the U.S. compared to your cousins in Europe. Uh, they have far stronger downstream results, mainly because of their marketing asset and also their trading operation. On that basis, that, uh, do you think for sure fund that is the right uh, recipe so that uh, you may want to further boost your marketing asset? I mean, you've been selling down your marketing asset over the past 10 plus years. And for trading, historically, you guys look at it as a facilitation a core center, while your European peer uh, looking at it as a profit center to trade around the asset. So is that the way right approach for you or that you don't think it's way right fit for you? Thank you. Okay, Paul, I'll start then. Um, look, we're gonna be disciplined with our capital that's true in our conventional business, and you've seen that with the announcement of our organic capital budget. That's true in our acquisitions. You saw that when we walked away from Anadarko uh, and collected a billion dollar termination fee. And I think you've seen that in how we executed the Noble transaction being the first uh, to announce and complete uh, that, that, and that's in, that, an acquisition. And it's gonna be true in energy transition. There, no one in Chevron has an open checkbook. Uh, and that's, again, that's true in our conventional business. That's true in our m a and that's true in energy transition. Um, what you have seen is, uh, you know, uh, investments now that are on the order of hundreds of mil hundreds of millions of dollars. We talked about 100 million into our uh, marginal abatement cost uh, curve investments, uh, 200 million in uh, renewable natural gas. So the investments really are limited by what we believe um, are uh, or reflect what we believe are the opportunities that are again good for the environment, address climate change and good for our shareholders. Um, in terms of do we need to adopt this change in strategy, um, I, I think we've been pretty clear that we're not going to diversify away or divest from our core business. The actions we're taking around the energy transition are geared to um, making these businesses that are, that are good businesses uh, that play an important role in society and making them more sustainable in a lower carbon future. So I think you should expect us to continue to do that, uh, we, um, we, we are going to 
uh, operate in businesses where we have competitive advantage, where we have a value proposition for shareholders uh, that uh, is advantage relative to other alternatives. Um, and again, we're going to do that in a way that is part of a lower carbon future. So maybe we'll go to Mark on the downstream question. Thanks for the question, uh, Paul. You, you know, on the on the marketing question, we, we've consistently indicated that we are interested in strengthening our value chains. In fact, you could say that here in the third quarter that we've demonstrated the benefit of link, link, uh, linking our um, refinery production to higher margin product placement, and that's kind of our view of a of a value chain. And, and I could I would suggest that the recent Puma transaction is an example of us strengthening our value chain in Asia, where where we have essentially added terminals and retail stations in Australia where we can now place our Asian joint venture refinery uh, production in a very strong market where we own the, uh, the strongest brands. And uh, we, we acquired that on, on June 30th and the first three months in, it's working just as we would have, have expected. So I think that goes to the concept of strengthening our value chain. To your comment on the, on the, the, the trading portion of our, our portfolio, you know, our trading business is designed first to ensure that we flow product, second that we optimize around those value chains, and then we trade in those areas where we have demonstrated considerable expertise, and it's vital to our downstream business. They're critical partners in regard to how we run our business and make those value chains work, and they continue to look for opportunities to increase their, their impact. So I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the question because the way we think about our value chains is important to us. Thank you. I, I'll just add, I, I think our shareholders support our approach to trading uh, because I think they understand the added risk and volatility that can come with trading earnings, and, and, and it generally attracts a little multiple because, because of that, in particular, in a resource company. Uh, Paul, thanks for your questions. We appreciate it. Thank you. We'll go next to Doug Leggett at Bank of America. No, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mark, maybe I could take advantage of you being on the, the call I just wonder if you could offer some perspectives on how you see the this this bottoming process of of the downstream cycle playing out. What what signposts are you seeing in any of your markets in terms of um, you know any green shoots or or any expectations that we're going to be here for a while? And I guess what's behind my question is is Chevron totally done with rationalisation in your um, in your downstream portfolio? Well, no, thank you. It's a, it's a thoughtful question. You're given the unique situation we're in. If I if I go back to the question Neil Neil asked about, you know, it relates to margins in general. I mentioned three things that that we have to see to feel like we are on a path uh, for greater sustainable margins in the downstream business, and it is that demand recovery you know, for, for all high value products. And and you can see some of those things happening in our Asian markets where we see Australia past. It's 2019 levels. We see certain Southeast Asia markets going beyond their levels. And, and with our, our strong brand, we've been able to go past industry uh, rates of growth in, in some of our areas. So I think those are opportunities that will, will help us on the demand side of the equation. The inventory reduction, I think the industry has demonstrated over time that it will work through that, but that will take a little bit of time. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, the refinery rationalization as an industry, while we've done the, the uh, predominance of our rationalization, we're always looking at strengthening the value chains in which we've chosen to compete, and, and we'll continue to look at that over time. But the green shoot, I would say, is the amount of companies that are announcing suggested um, rationalizations. And I, I think if those come through, you, we might see getting to those recovered margins sooner uh, than maybe we would naturally expect. We won't presume that. You know, we will stay focused on the self-help side of the equation, you know, things that we can control, like lowering our operating costs, uh, certainly running efficiently with the, with the desired yields, and then using data analytics to, to place and price our products. So we'll, we'll focus on what we can control, but uh, we're hoping that some of those green shoots actually come to fruition. Thank you. I was, uh, um, my my follow-up is for... Um, is for for Pierre, if I may. Pierre, just uh, some clarification on the CapEx. What's the cash CapEx number? And related, given the, the you know headcount reduction and so on you've had, what should we think of as apples for apples operating cost reductions as we look at 21 versus 20? And I'll leave it there. Thank you. 
Yeah, so again, we'll give all the details on our capital program when it's formally approved, but a, a cash uh, equivalent, uh, excluding affiliates of about $10 billion is a good number to use right now. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I can say much more on OPEX. OPEX. I think uh, Devin asked that question. Um, you know, again, we have a billion of reductions we've seen this year, a billion that we'll see next year through transformation, noble synergies, and as I said, we'll put that all together and provide some guidance um, here in the first quarter. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Rose. We'll take our next qu question from Paul Sankey at Sankey Research. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, Paul. Um, hi. Uh, you, you've, you've talked about your industry-leading balance sheet, and we've seen some incredible deterioration in values around the various other oils, even globally. In terms of acquisitions, um, I assume that you're now very happy with your Permian position. It feels as if uh, it's difficult to find anything that would improve your position. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I assume that you don't want to add debt um, without there being a compelling opportunity, which I assume there kind of isn't globally. It just seems that you're in such a strong competitive position. I wonder if you're thinking about actually doing some more deals. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, Look, we're focused on integrating Noble successfully, and we're off to a really good start. I also talked about our transformation, again, as enterprise-wide restructuring uh, that we've been working on for almost a year now and will go in effect November 1st. And, and so those are really our priorities. Um, as we've said, we have a high bar for M&A, um, and Noble cleared that bar. And so it's, you know, quality assets. It meets our criteria of quality assets at a good value, you know, at the right time. I'm just not going to speculate about future M&A. Um, if I do talk about our financial priorities, I mean, I think we've been pretty consistent and clear on what they are. Uh, sustain and grow the dividend. We've done that for 33 straight years. Invest to support long-term value, and we're doing that in our organic program. And, of course, we've done that through our noble acquisition and maintain a strong balance sheet, which we've been able to do with a net debt ratio of 17.5%. In terms of the Permian, I think, and you think you said it very well, we have a leading position. Noble provides a nice bolt-on. Um, again, our M&A is, is not focused necessarily on, on the Permian. It's focused on assets uh, that are creative to our shareholders, that are good value for our shareholders that add quality assets. Thanks, Thanks, Paul. Do you have a follow-up? I do, actually. Yeah, it's a totally different subject. Could you talk about um, your OPEC curtailments and anything you can add on the neutral zone? Thank you. Yeah, in terms of the neutral zone, uh, the production was about 30,000 barrels a day, our share, in the third quarter, so that startup is going well. Uh, in terms of our curtailments overall, the guidance we provided uh, was about 100,000 barrels of oil equivalent, so that's oil and gas equivalent. Um, and the majority of that is OPEC plus related. So 80 or 90 percent of that is OPEC plus related, and that's again in uh, countries like Kazakhstan, Nigeria, and Angola. Just quickly, thanks, the, Paul. The, where are you headed on neutral zone? Just quickly, where, 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 where will that go to? We we haven't provided any guidance. We're focused on continuing uh, having a safe and gradual ramp up. So again, we're at a near 30,000 barrels a day Chevron um, share, and we'll update you uh, at year end. Thank you, sir. Thanks. We'll go next to Viraj Borkataria at RBC. Hi, thanks for taking my uh, questions. Um, the first one I had was on just a clarification on TCO. The co-lending uh, figure has gone down for the last uh, couple of successive quarters. Um, is it safe to assume, given you've had issues mobilizing the workforce, that that the bit that's missing from 2020 just gets pushed to 2021? That would be our first question. Yeah, so uh, there's two parts to that. I mean, let me just address, you know, TCO project spending is about down a billion our share this year relative to what we had planned, uh, in part due to the demobilization. But we said about half of that are true uh, cost efficiency savings, and about half will be deferred to next year and, and future years. That's sort of related to the lending, but not entirely, right? The lending is also dependent on dividend policy and, and prices, but you're correct that you've seen uh, that the uh, lending has come down, our, our, our guidance on it has come down during the course of the year, which is, again, a combination of lower project spending, uh, but also um, uh, where prices have gone. 
Got it. Makes sense. Um, and then the second question on a slightly different topic, but when you're looking at project sanctions, uh, just in the context of your um, kind of energy transition approach, do, do you currently assume a carbon price, even where countries themselves do not have a sort of fiscal uh, framework in place? And if so, can you kind of tell us what the what the carbon price you're using is? Yeah, we we don't disclose uh, we don't disclose our price forecast for oil and oil and gas prices. We think it's commercially sensitive. We don't disclose our carbon price forecast. We look at it under a variety of scenarios, uh, both commodity prices and carbon pricing, and we look at it by jurisdiction because it, it can vary. Um, the investments that uh, Mark uh, you know referred to uh, certainly are policy supported, so they, they generate in some cases low carbon fuel credits or uh, renewable fuel standard, the federal standard. And so, again, it really varies by jurisdiction. Uh, we are uh, looking at returns. Again, we're trying to make investments in energy transition that are both uh, good for the environment and good for shareholders. And some of that return is policy enabled, but it really does vary by jurisdiction. Thanks, Baraj. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Thanks. We'll go next to Roger Reed at Wells Fargo. Hey, thank you. Good morning. Morning, Roger. Just uh, two questions I have for you. The first, uh, I know you said all the modules are in Kazakhstan now, but any more update you can provide, like how many people are actually able to, to muster to the site and kind of thought process as we head into the typically slower winter season for what this might imply for, you know, budgetary and, and time frame of, of startup on the, the next phases. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Look, the remobilization is going well. I, I said we're near 15,000 uh, of workforce on the project, and we're heading uh, to end the year above 20. Uh, so far, our safeguards are working well. We've kept the rate of infection very low, and we're seeing our work progress in line with expectations. So the key for us going forward to holding costs and schedule is to complete the remobilization, sustain a full workforce during a pandemic using our safeguards and achieve our pro our progress milestone. So uh, we're, we're, as you say, we're in the, I would say early days, we're in the middle of the remobilization. Uh, we're heading into winter. Uh, we need to see how this all progresses and we'll know more by our investor day and we plan to provide an update then. Having all uh, material and modules on the ground is a really important milestone. It does mean that uh, we are now can just address all of the work um, in place. Uh, and so that's, those are really the keys for us going forward in terms of, again, uh, maintaining cost and schedule. Okay, great. And then a quick unrelated follow-up, if I could. As you look across your various operations, uh, leave Noble out of this, but everybody's cut spinning, everybody's cut drilling. Just curious if you see anything in the way of decline rates that are either better or worse than what you would have anticipated thinking whether it's Permian or Gulf of Mexico or, or you know, just international? Uh, short answer is no. We're not seeing any surprises. I mean, the Permian is a little bit uh, higher than our early guidance. If you recall, at our market response press release, I think it was March 24th or 25th, uh, we guided to the exit rate on the Permian being down 20%. We'll be a little bit better than that. So our production in the Permian was 565,000 barrels oil equivalent. Uh, we think our exit rate, this is Chevron only, we think our exit rate will be around 550. And again, that's a little better than we had guided to uh, back in March. Now we'll have the noble uh, Permian production on top of that, that's about 50, so we expect to be uh, near 600. So uh, we're, we're managing, um, again, we're, we're, we're sustain we are uh, managing declines very well. Uh, we are not putting a, a lot of capital to add short-term production because of oversupplied uh, markets, but we're pleased with how we're operating the upstream. Uh, just like Mark's talked about safe and reliable operations, uh, we're seeing the same on our, on our upstream operations. Thanks, Roger. Great. Thanks. We'll move next to Sam Margolin at Wolf Research. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, morning, Sam. My question is about uh, your renewable gas business. Um, you know, if you look at the California Air Resource Board carbon intensity scores, actually, when I first saw it, I thought it was a mistake because renewable gas is like a negative 400 or something totally off the charts. I guess you're constrained by the CNG market, which I don't know how big it is, but given the emissions benefits of this product, are you able to offset 
you know, all or at least a significant amount of your obligations from the refining business um, under the LCFS? Sam, this is Mark. Thank you. Thank you for the question and, and the kind of the recognition of, of why we would be considering the renewable natural gas as part, as part of our value chain. I mean, it, we, we, you would, should expect us to be a strong player in the RNG space and policy-enabled markets like the, like the West. It, it, as you've indicated, it is the most cost and carbon efficient fuel from an LCFS and RFS perspective, and, and it's actually low execution risk. And so it leverages our strengths, our ability to partner with folks, uh, especially on the feedstock side, and then our ability to place the product, which got to your second element, that the, you need a place to put this over time. And so we're excited about the CalBio and the Brightmark and even the adoptive port announcements that we've made, and I think you'll, you'll see us continue to wisely grow here. Thanks for the, thanks for the question, um, Sam. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, and, I mean, I guess just it's a related follow-up, but, um, you know, one of the things that you've said that I think is differentiated from a corporate level is that, you know, you manage your capital planning not really on the basis of, of prices, um, but on how you see the demand outlook shaking out or or, um, or directionally, um, because you know the price can change and it might not necessarily reflect actual conditions. Um, but so, you know, in light of that, you know, you mentioned that we're transitioning to a low carbon world. You know, some some, some things could change depending on the election, but can this uh, renewable gas business, you know, if there really is market share to be had, um, can it scale beyond California? What other uh, geographic footprints are, are are out there for you? And um, you know, to basically just in terms of scope, uh, what what are you thinking here? Yeah, yeah. The short answer is is growth is clearly plausible. Um, we tend to look at this in regard to our existing value chains, where we have our strengths and where we can execute well, and we'll, we'll consider growth in that context, but there's certainly upside potential. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Next, we'll go to Manav Gupta at Credit Suisse. Uh, thank you for taking my question. You have two high-class refining assets in California, and we saw that the earnings were stronger in the downstream, as Neil pointed out. Um, the governor over there is indicating that he wants to ban the internal combustion engine in 2035, the sale of new vehicles. Um, is that any way changing the way you plan your business in California, or you think that he does not have the legal authority, as many legal experts are pointing out? Well, thanks for the, thank you for the question. I'm actually a native Californian. When I think about uh, California, I think of generally under normal conditions a very strong economy and a, and a tremendous desire for affordable mobility. And, and with, with that backdrop for the foreseeable future, to be successful in California from a fuels perspective, I think you have to have reliable re, um, refineries, a strong brand both to place the product and to keep a connection with the customer and an ability to participate in California's lower carbon future. And, and we've been here here in California for over, over 100 years, and I think we are well positioned to engage with the government to build a path towards the lower carbon future, and, and, and we will uh, actively participate that and believe we can do so. Okay, a Thank quick follow-up. A quick follow-up is uh, you have had two Nobel assets for about a month. Is, are there any upside surprises the thoughts like synergies you think you can do better on, uh, any integration you think you can do better on since you acquired those assets? Yeah, thanks, Manav. Look, it's going very well. Again, we're pleased to have been the first to announce a transaction and, and, to, and to complete it. Uh, it's a good fit, and I won't go through all that. Again, a very successful first month. Um, synergies are on track. We expect that there will be more as we operate as one company. Uh, in, in, the, in the first few weeks, we've been able, for example, to see uh, contracts and, and look at procurement opportunities. We're also starting to see operational synergies. Uh, we'll update you sometime in the first quarter. Just let us give us some time to fully assess the opportunities. Uh, we expect the synergy number to be higher. I don't have a number for you now. We're going to do that work and we'll advise you uh, in due course. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Jason Gableman at Catalan. Uh, yeah, hey, um, I wanted to circle back to this marginal abatement cost curve, which seems like a useful framework to use moving forward. Um, two two kind of related questions on it. One, does uh, this enable you to kind of get to net zero by 2030? It seems like your European peers are pushing towards that, and I'm assuming the U.S. is going to ultimately 
face pressure to hit net zero on its own emissions by 2030? And do you have any sense of what you'd be able, what you need to spend to achieve that now that you have this kind of cost curve model? And does Algonquin, the partnership with Algonquin, how does that kind of figure into this? Uh, I think you've been partnered with them for a couple of quarters, just one, wondering if that unlocks some of the opportunities um, within the uh, goal of reducing carbon intensity. Thanks. Yeah, Jason, look, we support the Paris Agreement, and as Mark says, we're going to be part of a lower carbon energy future. Um, our focus is on results, not pledges, and so what you're seeing are actions today um, and uh, that are addressing carbon intensity. I'm just not going to get further. We have our 2023 carbon intensity metrics I referred to uh, earlier that we're likely to update those uh, in time to get to the next uh, stock take uh, periods, but our approach, again, is really focused on delivering results that we think address climate change and are good for the environment. Uh, in terms of Algonquin, it's early days, but yeah, we see opportunities there. That that does both, right? It sort of increases renewables in support of our business. Uh, you've seen us do that in the Permian and in Bakersfield uh, with wind and solar projects that are providing power to our operations that we otherwise were buying off the grid. Um, and Algonquin is working on opportunities in other uh, areas of Chevron operations. This does take a little bit of time. Uh, you got to do some of the engineering work and the development work, but so far that joint venture is going well. Great. And just a uh, clarification, I appreciate um, on slide nine, you included downstream earnings, excluding timing effects, which is definitely useful. Is that a disclosure you plan on including going forward? And is 3Q20, does it imply kind of no timing effect this quarter? Just looking at where the graph, where the, where the bar is on the, on the graph. Thanks. Yeah, Jason. So in the very, the last slide of the appendix, you see that we actually give the absolute timing effects for U.S. Uh, and international downstream. So for a long time, we've been showing the variance, but as you said, you couldn't mm -hmm. figure out the absolutes in each quarter. So now we've shown that for going back to 2017, and yeah, you should expect us to continue to do that going forward. Great. That's that's helpful. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. We'll go next to Pavel Molkanov at Raymond James. Thanks for taking the question. Um, you do not have a massive footprint in Europe compared to uh, just about all the other super majors, but I am curious your thoughts, uh, another regulatory issue, the European climate law uh, getting ready to be passed five weeks from now and what the impact on your upstream and or downstream operations might be. Well, as you say, Pavel, although we've operated in Europe, upstream and downstream, for many decades, and, and I worked there in Aberdeen uh, when the first um, uh, you know, t carbon tax was enacted, uh, we've sold the majority of our upstream operations. We have a little non-op position still, um, and again, no uh, large-scale refining or marketing. We do have some lubricants and additives businesses in there. So I, I think, uh, again, we, we support the Paris Accord. Uh, we believe the future of energy is lower carbon. We expect more policy. I think it gets to what Mark was trying to uh, was, was addressing is getting the balance uh, between those worthwhile uh, policy goals and uh, uh, providing affordable, reliable energy that the world economies need. Just a quick follow-up uh, since we're a week ahead of the election. Uh, can you remind us on the combined Chevron plus Noble Permian acreage position, how much uh, of the acreage is federal? Yeah, it's about 10% is federal in terms of total Permian acreage. Perfect. Thanks, Bob. Thanks very much. We'll go next to Neil Dingman at Trust Security. Um, morning or afternoon, I'm smell, guys. I was hoping just you've talked a lot about these details on the um, renewables, but my question was more particularly on the Novi partnership. I'm just wondering, you know, again, on that, you know, uh, out of the Deer Park facility, could you talk about maybe some details on what industries you all might target uh, once that starts rolling out of that facility? Well, so, so the concept for, for Novi for our downstream business. Um, is to provide a renewable base oil to, to round out our base oil offering, both for our, our own business and for the business of others. The product itself, which is a technology partnership be between ourselves, leveraging our ISO dewaxing technology um, and, and some other 
uh, patented solutions uh, allows us to create, to take m multiple types of um, biofeedstocks and turn them into what, what I would consider higher performing base oils. There are other applications, e even in uh, cosmetics and things like that, that will be investigated over time, but we do see an opportunity for expansion of that, uh, of that joint venture should the uh, economics continue to warrant it. Thank you, thanks for the question. Sure, and then one maybe just quick follow-up on that it was, you certainly are doing a great job of continuing to move not only Novi, this 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 Cal biogas, and just to continue to move in, in the renewables in general. Do you all have you know sort of any target or where kind of metrics on where you would like to be as far as what you think renewables might be as a part of your you know potential total part of your business two or three years from now, or is it just too early to determine that? I'll give a first answer, then, and then maybe Pierre can build on this. I think it's, it's too early for us to say about what, how big it could become, but we do intend to continue to grow it as part of our as part of our business, and I think we can do that successfully while we return while we improve returns as well. Pierre, would you add anything? Yeah, that's, that's just well said. Again, I, I think I addressed earlier. No, no one has an open checkbook in Chevron to spend money. That's true in the conventional business and acquisitions and energy transition. We're going to pursue the opportunities that. Uh, for good for the environment, good for our shareholders, and 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 that will grow over time. Thanks, Neil. Very good. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks, Neil. Well, we've got through all the questions in the queue. I, I want to thank everyone for your time today. We do appreciate your interest in Chevron and everyone's participation on today's call. Please stay safe and healthy. Audra, back to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes Chevron's third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. You may now disconnect.